What's poppin' people? It's Dante, currently walking around Independence Hall here in Philadelphia. Beautiful day, and it's a Sunday. So my Sunday routine is to uh, actively tan my body, you know, take the shirt off, head to the Ray Street Pier. I like to look out at the horizon by Penn's Landing. We have this beautiful dragonfly here. Check this out. It's a drone. Um, <laughs> And so yeah, I love walking the perimeter of the city on this particular day. It seems that in the mornings, especially on Sunday, is very dormant in the streets. It's very quiet and it's so peaceful to get away from the chaos of urban life and explore the outskirts. And I found throughout my journey lots of potential in the outskirts of different cities all throughout the world. You know, one in particular I remember being in Mexico City. And so Mexico City, you know, it's a great place to practice street photography, you know, in the midst of the action, in the markets, you know, in different neighborhoods. You know, there's that gritty, raw kind of street photography that you can get in neighborhoods such as Tapito. But however, I found my most successful images on this trip along the outskirts and a town called, I believe, Idio Verdes or something along these lines where they have this gondola ride that takes you to the top of a mountain and there's various neighborhoods there to explore. And so I remember when I went to Mexico City, you know, finding some fruitful moments within the hustle and the bustle, you know, however, there was something in my intuition, there was something that was guiding me towards the mountainside. I remember looking out at the distance of the city and seeing the mountains and how they're, you know, cast across the horizon and how beautiful that looked and how much potential I found in my head. I was like, maybe there's something there. You know, there's something in my gut that told me to visit this location. Needless to say, walking around this part of town was quite the adventure. You know, many people tell you, oh, don't go to the top of the mountain, don't go to the outskirts, it's dangerous here. But maybe on the brink of danger, in the unknown, along the outskirts, in these places that are maybe in between, you know, these borders are where we can find interesting moments and experiences. I found that even throughout my journey in the West Bank, along this border, of Jericho. Some of my most fruitful photographs were made. Some of my greatest memories were made here. You know, there's also something about walking along the water that I find peaceful and fruitful, where I lived amongst the Bemba tribe in Zambia, Africa, along Lake Bengwelu in this beautiful location surrounded by water. And so maybe there's something in me that constantly calls me to the water. There's a sort of magnetic pool that I find peaceful and I become more thoughtful and mindful in the moment while walking around the outskirts of Philadelphia. So I do this really long walk from like 5.30 in the morning, you know, 5 a.m. around this time to sundown. Like I walk basically from sunrise to sunset alone i actually go to the top of the benjamin franklin bridge which is just this way firstly it's where i like to start my little outskirt walk i think on the weekends like sunday what's great about catching the sunrise is you become in tune with health right where i believe health is wealth right your circadian rhythm is set when you allow the sun to peer through your eyes, right? This is kind of basic stuff, but your biological clock is important to consider in life where I essentially rise and sleep with the sun, you know, where time isn't really of my concern, but to follow the light and to rise with the sun and to sleep with the sun is, you know, that's where I find my relationship to time is with the sun and you know, right now with my top off, my shirt off. Yeah, I feel, I feel as though 
I'm chilly now in the shade, right? When I'm in the darkness, when I'm in the shade, you know, oof, gets chilly right away. There's like a 30 degree difference, it feels like, between the sun and the shade. So when I step into this light, you know, I'm kissed by the sun. I feel good. I feel like my battery is being charged, you know, where our bodies maybe are like batteries and the sun is the charger and so spending maximum amount of time in the sun especially in the early morning when the sun is at an angle i fuel my power you know where i actually get more energetic and more energy when i'm under the sun as opposed to being indoors under air condition um, there's something about not being confined to the box the cubicle you know where i'm not out side simply for photography's sake and making pictures but i'm out here because i believe this is where humans are meant to thrive right where when i'm inside you know my soul it slowly dies but when you move your physical body through the world you exist outside the passage of time and yeah this is a great place to be moving your body walking you know i think there's an art to walking where walking barefoot connecting with the earth, connecting and feeling the sensations of the ground below you, it not only is good for your health, in my opinion, I think it's strength, I, I believe that it strengthens your feet, your legs, even your back, your posture. Oh wow, look, they're having a, look, there's like a Chinese gate or something over there. Maybe they're having a lantern festival this time around the year, I don't know. I think, yeah, lantern festival, cool. Maybe I'll have to check that out. That's always pretty interesting. And, yeah, with like walking barefoot, you know, it's interesting, right? Like the shoes that we wear, they're kind of like condoms where you don't feel the sensation. But when you take them off and wear these Vibram five finger ELX shoes, yeah, you can feel the sensation. <laughs> the only issue is the durability. Walking with a hole today. So I gotta be more careful. I ordered another pair. I'd say the durability of these shoes are like every couple of months, maybe every three months, you gotta get a new pair. But they're much more comfortable than regular shoes. And I find that when I wear regular shoes, my feet get sore, or they're cramped up. But when I wear the, these shoes, it just feels natural, it feels better. You know, we came into this world without shoes. Let's leave the world without shoes. Um, but yeah, this is the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. I love visiting this spot, you know, just checking out the horizon, checking out this elevated vantage point. I've been eyeing this Penn Treaty Park that's northeast from here that maybe I'll walk to someday. I'm thinking about going there today. Um, we'll see. I might not, I might, but that's a, uh, that's a spot that I keep seeing from this view and I'm kind of in tune to go there for some reason. I think after realizing the hand of William Penn, how it's positioned in this direction towards the Northeast, representing his treaty made with the Lenape tribe, I guess I'm intrigued to go to the Penn Treaty Park. So my thought with running is a lot of the times you're just rattling your bones, right? You're kind of just shaking your bones around, rattling your brain around. Um, maybe there's something to, maybe there's something with like running up stairs and running uphill or sprinting that's good. But any moderate pace, yeah, it seems to be rattling of the bone. Hey, look, we have a block here. Let's open on the other side. I made the wrong decision. I, I thought actually that this side was open and the other side was closed. So maybe they switched up this time. But yeah, I think actually running generally is bad for you in terms of longevity. You know, I've always, like I've never met a runner that, first of all, they're always like drinking alcohol. Like the one time I ran a half marathon in college, they were like giving beers out afterwards, beers during the run. You know, they always go out and get like food after like a big meal. 
you know, there's something about running and the culture around it that I never really understood. I think a lot of people that participate with cardio think that you burn calories or something through running and then somehow that's going to help with weight loss or something like that. But yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't believe in these notions. I think simple acts like fasting can go a long way and eating satiating foods. So, you know, for me, 18 months straight, 19 months now, I think, carnivore diet, 100% red meat. I never cheat one meal a day. I mean, seriously, these kind of things, they do keep the doctor away where I haven't felt sick once. I feel nothing but increase of power each and every day um, an abundance of it, frankly, where sometimes at the end of the day, I'm still super energized and have to knock out some pull-ups or push-ups or whatever and like tire my body out before I eat my meal and then go to bed. It's kind of crazy. Biggest life hack of all time. Highly suggest it. I mean, if you're looking to increase your health and fitness and become the strongest, most beautiful version of yourself, yeah, I can't help but recommend the carnivore diet enough. Seems to work for me, maybe it'll work for you. Yeah, who knows? All I know is, once you start eating red meat, you really do realize that a lot of these things that we work for, you know, where we're working these jobs we hate, buying shit you don't need, buying food you don't need. You know, think of like the food pyramid and how at the top of the pyramid, it tells you not to eat red meat as much. It tells you to eat it sparingly. I think it's been demonized for some odd reason and maybe there's misconceptions around cholesterol that need to be understood deeply and i think that most of the foods that are processed junk that you find in a grocery store are what keep people addicted to food thinking of kellogg's thinking of coca-cola general mills you know these cereals these grains these things that are cheap and affordable that people feed their families makes people slaves makes people consumers to corporations and just it's just not necessary like once you start actually eating food that fills your belly you really don't go hungry like i can easily fast for 48 hours three days you know if needed if i want to because i eat an abundance of fat and protein and so yeah maybe become more critical become more skeptical especially in these modern times where clearly obesity is rampant especially in america you know maybe there's something in the foods that we're eating you know maybe we shouldn't be eating it um, if you just go to a grocery store and look at all these things, yeah, most of it isn't real food. I think that maybe real food is flesh, you know? When I consider my time in Jericho, I remember sleeping on the floors of mosques, fasting, right? This is where I learned to fast during Ramadan. And then specifically, Eid al-Adha, the day of sacrifice, hundreds of sheep are slaughtered in this village and at the end of the day at the end of the fast where people make this sacrifice you know that may become a spiritual journey right the fasting you know you come together at the end of the sacrifice and feast together and yeah i'll never forget this paradigm shifting moment right these kind of things have been true and you know there are, are, are stories from the from the beginning of time right from the old testament in genesis you know it's like one of the oldest uh it's one of the oldest tricks in the book guys uh start fasting there really is something about fasting that i'm starting to believe more in this spiritual 
path of fasting that does get you closer to God. You know, where there's that saying, right, that we're created in His image, created in God's image. Yeah, I believe that when you remove things and remove toxins, especially in this modern world, yeah, you wind up becoming more beautiful through the subtraction of the superfluous that reveals your true, pure soul. And yeah, my thought is that the soul, it's your body, right? Like the human being is a skin suit, flesh, you know, this bag of bones. But the soul is the connection between your mind and your body, the outward reflection or representation of the self. So if you look at somebody, I think that you can read their soul. You can see who they truly are by actually just looking at a person. And so I suggest following the light. You know, the light is the truth. Um, to be under the sun, you know, you will tan your skin and ultimately be more beautiful. Maybe a lot of our lives are designed in a way that keeps us inside, it keeps us in boxes, it keeps us cooped up indoors where we come outside and we put sunglasses on and we trick our bodies to think that we're still inside and, you know, we just have this like tendency to find pleasure and comfort within the cave, within the shadows, within the darkness. But I think that going forward, we should design our lives in a way that we maximally stay outside. You're not getting me to sit inside. I'm not being sat down and told what to do, when to do something. You know, you, you, you gotta unshackle yourself, right? I think that is something worth considering. You know, we must thrive on our own as on our own as well like find what works for you find a way to live your life that works best for you you know maybe you know the pursuit of a career is kind of um, a basic thing right what you work until you're 65 you retire and then you got like another fucking eight or ten years of your life before you die to do the things that you want to do and sacrifice for your physical body being stuck in a freaking office or some shit like if anything being outside and working it's certainly a much better option you know where you couldn't pay me a million dollars a year honestly to sit on my ass in a comcast tower in one of these like skyscrapers in the city these like big skyscrapers and just be there for eight hours a day from morning till night, you know, where I can't even catch the sunrise or sunset or have my skin feel the light, you know, or be told to sit down for eight. Like, can you imagine, like we're sitting down for like the entirety of the day, but I'm designing my life in a way where I don't sit down. I literally, I only sit down when I go to bed. Maybe I sit down when I eat, that's it. Like, we should be inside just to sleep and eat. I don't, I'm starting to really think that. Like, there's something about the way that we coop ourselves up indoors that's really, really bad. It's really, it's not good. And, um, obviously I'm really passionate about this, but it's something in me, you know? It feels as though we're still stuck in the desert. You know, in between the slave, enslavement of Egypt and finding the paradise. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, you got to find your own way out of Egypt. It's up to you. But it's merely in your mind, right? Freedom, the more I contemplate, I think it's a mindset, right? Freedom is to be playful, to be like a child, but also to be dangerous like a lion. And to be free is like a bird flying in the sky without really any care in the world, sort of naivete, optimism. Um, but courageous, right, in flight, and playful, you know, dancing, fluttering like a bird. You know, there's something about birds, there's something about even just coming to an elevated spot like this that makes you feel more free, where you elevate your body physically and almost feel like a bird, where you have this view in 360 degrees, right, this like panopticon view of the city, of the land, 
and yeah it feels like you conquer the day and i can't start my day without coming to an elevated view so yeah on the weekends i choose to come to this spot another thought is maybe we should just treat the life that we live like a video game you know consider games like skyrim you know where you're starting your journey you load up the game you start to design your character right you're naked you're looking at your avatar you you're selecting your facial features your eyebrows your skin color your height your weight you know what armor are you gonna wear what color sword or whatever are you gonna use um and maybe we should strip down to that naked state right removing the shirt um removing the shoes you know redesigning yourself from the ground up sort of like starting a new video game um thinking of games like tony hawk's pro skater i remember playing this game a lot on the playstation you know your character develops over time by acquiring stat points and assigning them to your skater and if you understand the fundamentals of the game you'll understand that speed and air are typically the most important attributes to have in the game to advance and move forward so when you speed run when you play the game and you you know try to you know unlock all the new spots and collect skate you know and find the secret tape you can do these things in the game quicker by understanding what attributes are critical so yeah speed and air i would always max out right you want to max out your speed you want to max out your air because it's going to allow you to get to those spots that are hard to reach in the game and yeah, look, I, I, I found the secret tape up here. But yeah, no, when I consider photography and art and becoming a better artist, becoming a stronger photographer, you know, maybe we should consider speed as a critical attribute to becoming the best version of ourselves as photographers. And so by using a compact digital camera like the Ricoh GR3, you know, as you can see, I'm making quick, sh quick sort of snapshots and everything is done with speed from the ground up with my newfound process using high contrast black and white i use the automatic modes just setting the snap focus to infinity so i can capture everything in focus from this view you know there's something about speed in the realm of photography and art that i believe we should consider more you know we get caught up with making these great photographs these sharp pictures you know making these photos that are so complex and all this kind of stuff but actually, we should start going forward like we're <laughs> in that boring phase of Minecraft where you're grinding in the dungeon for XP, you're grinding to find diamonds, right? There's something that, it's something in the game that you have to just get out of the way. And in Minecraft, in order to advance to the boss and to get to the Ender Dragon, you need diamonds, right? And to find the diamonds, you have to grind, right? There's this period of time where you're just banging at stone and you're looking and you're searching for that particular ore that is the most valuable and rare in the game. And so in order to get there, I believe we must go forward with speed, right? Think about those first 10,000 photographs that you'll make, right? Those are typically the worst, right? But let's get them out of the way, right? Let's advance our character. Let's advance our photography along our journey by moving with speed, by using tools that will allow us to get there. And so I think it's important to consider these things. And, you know, even consider in Minecraft, right? The most fun part of the you know the, the most fun part of the game right it's fighting the dragon it's going on the adventure right in minecraft you can sit around you can farm you can mine you can do things like building and doing creative acts which is awesome and it's a part of the game right 
But the most exciting part is dropping into the nether, going into hell, coming back out, and then fighting the dragon, right? Like that's the exciting part. So when you conquer the castle and find the portal and you jump through it and you have this epic battle and this adventure and this sort of lust for battle in you as a player in Minecraft, you're having the most fun. You're enjoying the process. And I think that is where we should be with our photography, where we simply enjoy that process, you know, that journey as the most fruitful and enjoyable part of it all, where we detach ourselves from the outcome. We detach ourselves from those um, I think in the game now you get like wings now if you beat the boss, right? Which was something implemented newly that I really have, I've never even acquired the wings, right? I've never gotten the wings in Minecraft. I never got the wings. Because I stopped playing by that point, right? When they, when they added the wings that allow you to fly, I stopped playing Minecraft. But the game, it's always updating. And what if we don't get the wings, right? That's fine, right? Like maybe you'll never get the wings but you'll enjoy the process of attempting and trying to get the wings, right? So the autotelic approach, the autotelic mindset, doing things for the sake of doing things and finding joy in it. You know, this is where I thrive in my creative endeavors every single day where you know, there's really no excuse. I always have a camera on me. I throw it in my pocket. I'm making photographs quickly with speed. And, you know, it takes a lot of time to find things that are interesting. It takes a lot of time spent doing the thing, right? And so embracing that process, you know, and finding joy and meaning in it, it will bring us closer to success. Where for me, success in photography is curiosity. I believe this is the ultimate goal, right? It's to increase your curiosity 1% each and every day. It's to just simply wake up in the morning eager to go out there and to explore like a co like a child again, right? You want to be this big kid with a camera open without preconceived notions of what you will find, right? But the motivation is in your legs. You must simply set your body in motion where the more that you move, the more that you will see. And the more that you see, the more that you will do, right? Think less, shoot more, do more. Um, and put that sword to the grindstone like it's Skyrim, like you're grinding for Daedric armor, like you're putting those daggers down uh, at the blacksmith and uh, <laughs> sharpening your sword, right? So there is something about this. Also, when it comes to practical suggestions, while I find that fasting is something that increases my spiritual growth, I think also there's something about it with the connection between you and the world around you where your mind is sharp, right? Your eyes are sharp and you become laser focused on the moments that are fleeting. And I believe that this is something that we can all achieve, right? This sort of sharp visual acuity, like a hunter, you know? When you're fasted, there is this clear connection between your mind and your body where I am recognizing these patterns that exist in both nature and human behavior with clairvoyance, you know, where I can predict patterns. I can predict things before they even unfold a lot of the times while I'm on the street and embracing the spontaneity and the serendipity, you know, where I even believe in this idea now with my process of shooting with the wrist strap. I use this wrist strap because it's an extension of my eye, right? It's, it's, it's an extension of my body at this point, right? Where I kind of forget that the camera is there. And so I've been using this kendama, kendama meaning sword in Japanese, I believe, where the kendama, it's this ball and it's, it's like a ball on a string with a stick and it's a skill toy. It enhances your hand-eye coordination and you know, I thrive on the streets by making compositions with my intuition where I'm aware of the composition as I'm making it using an LCD screen, right? I have compositional awareness, but there's something about this practice of increasing your hand-eye coordination skills and photography that I don't think is talked about, right? Where photography, it is this visual game of recognizing the patterns in the world. It's about 
putting the puzzle pieces together, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. You know, you must also recognize, however, the physicality of the medium, the agility required while you're on the streets, you know, even camera operation, right? A lot of these things that aren't talked about as much. And, you know, for me, photography, ultimately it's this physical pleasure, right? Where you have to physically be present in the world and bear witness at the front lines of life, right? For that is where the photographer ultimately thrives. It's on the front lines, right? Close to life, both physically and emotionally. You know, where I'm not just making a photograph, I'm making photographs as a way for me to connect more with life itself and to find meaning in it and to affirm my life and uplift humanity to champion mankind to a new height that hasn't been seen before, right? Where when I look at these beautiful sculptures that are depicted all across City Hall at the center of our city, I'm reminded of the beauty of architecture. You know, the way that these columns are looming and the way that you must look up at these sculptures and these buildings and this magnificent artwork, right? When I step in front of the bronze sculpture of the eagle at the center of the Wanamaker building. I'm looking up at this world's largest playing pipe organ and I'm listening to a talented musician playing some of the most beautiful uplifting music that fuels me with vitality, right? When I walk into a Catholic church in Rome and I step foot in front of a Caravaggio painting depicting these biblical narratives in this beautiful aesthetic during the Baroque period, right? Some of these beautiful churches and artworks that have been produced, I'm just astonished by. And, um, you know, they make you feel something on an emotional level that I believe we can try to achieve within the realm of photography, where I believe that photography can become the apex of art. You know, I believe that photography and a photograph, it exists outside the passage of time. It, it transcends space and time. It goes beyond physics. A photograph is this special work of art that I am very much intrigued by to this day after a decade of practicing each and every day, basically all the time. And yeah, there's something in me that's still curious that sparks me in the morning to get out there and to try again and give it another shot and just take some more shots, right? And so, you know, another practical suggestion is to go slow, right? When I walk, through the streets, I'm walking at a slow pace. I entered this Zen zone. You know, it's a very meditative practice as well, where when you're walking, you're meditating, right? Right now I'm thinking and I'm flowing and I'm speaking, but when I'm walking, I'm not thinking. I'm just moving and I'm becoming one with the street itself. And, you know, when I consider meditation, I don't think it has to be this thing that you do behind closed doors, in the dark, with the lotus pose, with yourself humming or, making some chanting noise or whatever. For me, photography is the ultimate outlet for meditation that I've ever found, you know, and I thrive walking. And so, yeah, this is just where I am. I'm always outside. You know, where can you find Dante? You can find me on the front lines of life. That's where I'll be, um, endlessly. And so, Yeah, I, I feel like photography, art, you know, these things just give life meaning. And maybe in this time we are looking for that, you know, where we live in this age of abundance, where we have all these fancy cars that are driving across this incredible bridge that who knows how man has even constructed this. Um, <laughs> you know, we have all the yummy food options, entertainment, TV shows, you know, all the technology in the world. Now we're having this amazing artificial intelligence that's being implemented that I f feel like enhances our ability to learn and we can wield for good. And so I'm very optimistic. I feel like going forward, this sort of naive, childlike optimism is needed. And, you know, it's not just kindness for kindness sake. And it's not just optimism for optimism's sake. But I actually think that when you change yourself, right? When you become more selfish 
you can then go out and be selfless and change the world, right? Where your impact on a stranger, whether you're holding the door open for them, smiling at them, listening to them, you know, engaging with life and engaging with others with kindness, you know, we can brighten the world and become this beacon of light that shines brightly. And I think we should hone in on this notion of light as photographers, you know, where the light maybe is the truth. You know, where we're painting with light, you know, we wield light, this ultimate source of power that fuels me with this sensation, this blissful, abundant sensation where I'm very grateful to be alive. I'm very grateful to have another day, right? And I think that abundant feeling comes through gratitude and appreciation for the simple pleasures of life, such as walking, sunlight, and clean water. You know, and then everything else is a is an upside. Everything else is superfluous. And 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 when you recognize that and you have this feeling, well, then you can go forward and onward. You know, and I think that is the goal. It's to move onward into the unknown, to articulate it and put order to the chaos. You know, similar to the way in which this world was born. Right? This universe was created from a formless state but light and the way that it etches and gives form to surfaces places people faces all these things you know it you know the world itself becomes this canvas right the world is the ultimate canvas where we are not confined to a box we are not confined to the four corners of a canvas but we can walk endlessly right where you can live until you're 120 years old but you will not see everything in this world you will not do everything you will not see everything you will not experience everything and that abundant feeling it's something that propels me onward into the unknown into the chaos where i find peace in it you know i find peace in the chaos of the streets i find peace in the chaos of the unknown you know where you have to go forward with courage you know what is the what is a photograph you know, I think that we think of a photograph as this tangible thing, you know, light on surface. Um, you know, what kind of paper did you use or what film stock or what camera and all these kind of things that determine the result of a photograph. But I believe in this notion of a photograph being simply, it's a reflection of your courage, right? Someone the other day asked me, oh, are you shooting from the hip? You know, they, they saw me with my Rico and I was like explaining to them how I, how I use the camera and he was like, are you shooting from the hip? Or I was explaining how when I make compositions with my intuition, I'm very much aware of the, how the result will potentially be before I even watch the scene as it unfolds. And that's because I'm photographing from my heart. You know, that's what I've realized. It's, it's, it's all about courage and curiosity and, you know, courage, core, meaning heart, right? A photograph is a reflection of your heart. Don't shoot from the hip, shoot from the heart. You know, there's something about this notion of courage that I believe will propel us and have us almost go through the unknown unscathed, sort of like we come out of the chaos on a feather bed, untouched. You know, we are the untouchables. You know, I think about my time photographing on the front lines of conflict and Palestine. I don't know what led me there other than my intrepidness and my courageousness. You know, I'm curious about the world, about life. I want to experience all of its complexities. You know, I think of the story of David, you know, armoring himself with God, with courage to go out onto the battlefield at the Valley of Elah and to use his slingshot, that precision of the headshot, you know, this big beast, Goliath, was defeated by a small shepherd boy. And these stories, I believe, shape our reality. And perhaps the photographs that we make are our new reality, right? The photographs become this new world, right? We can create a new world in a fraction of a second. Think of this miraculous ability that we possess as photographers. It's a miracle to make a photograph. Sometimes I think this way. <laughs>
we can create a new world in a fraction of a second and I don't know when I think of that it really does remind me how endless photography is where it does not matter where you are in this world right where I can walk this same mundane lane every single day but still find something in nothing right you know there may be seemingly nothing but you can always create something um, with the power of photography where it really does become this superpower similar to that courage and that armor of God that David wielded you know maybe armor is more important you know in armoring yourself with courage but I wield my camera as a sword striking through the heart of chaos revealing the soul of the street and create visual order and harmony through the spontaneity of everyday life and When I consider courage, when I consider intrepidness, when I consider bravery, you know, and all of these kind of things that I believe are required for the photographer, right? For the photographer is in the chaos, in the unknown. You don't know what, could, what, what can happen out here on the front lines of life, right? And, you know, consider like the news, right? You know, if you consume the news, if you consume all this endless media, well, I believe a lot of it is just promoting fear right you consume the news and there's nothing but doom and gloom and well that's not gonna make you leave your room you know you might as well just bundle up get under your covers put on netflix um and just sit on the sidelines of life you know where you're living in fear but when you go forward without fear onto the front lines with the camera in hand it really does become this superpower and you know stories such as the founding of Rome, you know, and these two boys, Remus and Romulus, being raised in the unknown, right, in the wild, raised by the wolf, the she-wolf, La Lupa, yeah. you know, these myths, these stories, they intrigue me, and could you imagine what bravery, what intrepidness, what courageousness you would be feeling while raised in the wild by a wolf as a baby, as an infant. You know, at that point, going forward, nothing will stop you. You can then find Rome. You can then be a founder of Rome. One of the greatest empires. Looking up at the clouds, looking up at the sky. Now I'm just a mere ant in the colony, no longer at that elevated view. And, you know, maybe we are all, you know, like these ants in the colony, but every ant does have a role to play, right? I think of the movie, A Bug's Life, where Flick is this inventor, this innovator, and Flick is very creative and he was trying to find ways to speed up the harvest where the colony is providing food for the grasshoppers who are using their power over these bugs, right? Over these ants because of their sheer physical force, you know, similar to the way in which the Roman Empire has used their military force to rule over other people. And so, Flick wanting to help out, you know, where the ants are all working and toiling and finding themselves with grains on their backs one by one. Flick made this machine to then harvest more at a single time. You know, Flick was making telescopes with leaves and dew. Um, you know, Flick was trying to find ways to make it so that the colony can thrive, so that they can harvest more. And unfortunately, this one ant you know, kind of stood out, right? This ant, Flick, he was kind of getting in the way. The queen didn't really like him. So Flick had this great idea of going on his own and finding his own path where he found this dandelion and he flew across the canyon and went in search for warrior bugs in other parts of the town, on other parts of the 
of the of, of like the nearby land outside of the colony, right? He left. He was the first ant to leave the colony. You know, when you're the first ant to leave the colony, then he went out to find these warrior bugs, bring them back, and he wound up fighting against the grasshoppers and winning in the end. And then the colony can thrive. And <laughs> that was what I'm, I, I actually think it was either a bug's life or um, The Goonies. I think these were like two of my first movies. And yeah, maybe there's something about movies, my memory, and the way that these influence our lives in an interesting way, sort of subconsciously. Um, I've always been adventurous, thinking of the Goonies on this adventure, looking for buried treasures, you know, not buried treasures, but treasures on this pirate ship, you know, this sort of coming of age film where all these boys are essentially under pressure, they're all friends, you know, the Goonies are being threatened by the realtors, you know, where the father can no longer pay his mortgage or his rent or whatever the case may be. And because of this, they were being removed and they went to the last resort, you know, they went for this adventure. They went and found the treasure, you know, they discovered the skeleton of One-Eyed Willie and in the end, they were able to stay together. Um, but there's that call to adventure that these boys felt, right? There's this call to adventure that Flick felt in search for his warrior bugs. And so maybe the individual within the colony must strive to be like the hero, right? Thinking of Flick or thinking of the Goonies, you know, on this adventure or here along Penn's Landing, the Delaware, you know, we have the story of George Washington crossing the Del Delaware, you know, this revolutionary hero, you know. These kind of stories, they flow through me, right? When I'm by the water, maybe these memories, these stories, this the past, you know, time, it echoes um, in the water. And, you know, I'm thinking of Washington and his intrepidness crossing this very water to then fight against the British and be that revolutionary hero to then found America, you know, the United States, the Roman Empire 2.0, you know, where we might as well consider America this way. You know, I'm reminded of this when I walk down towards Washington Avenue and I see those ships by the Navy Yard and our naval force that we have all, all across the seven seas, all across this world, right? Where the United States, this is the greatest place to be. This is, this is it. You know, I think that this is the apex of where human civilization can be and strive to become. I think that we have so much abundance here, but a lot of the time we squander. You know, I think we maybe squander our potential with the pursuit of pleasure, right? Where we do become self selfish in a destructive way um, through the pursuit of pleasure. Um, through overindulgence and gluttony and hedonistic pleasures and sex. Um, you know, where sex, it's merely just a little bit of gooey stuff that comes out of the orifice and then you feel like a, like a slight sensation for a second. Um, it's really not something to pursue. Um, and... <laughs> it's funny. It's freaking true. So true. It's such a distraction. A lot of things are distracting. You know, all these pleasures that we have at our fingertips, at our disposal, are, are just distracting and striving us away from becoming the greatest version of ourselves. You know, when I consider my time as a Peace Corps volunteer, I think this is one of my most paradigm, sh paradigm shifting events where I worked with rural aquaculture. I was a rural, that's such a, why is that a weird word to say? Rural, rural, rural. I was a rural aquaculture promotion specialist in Zambia, Africa, working alongside the Department of Fisheries in Luapula Province, Sampia District, Impanta, tri Impanta Village, member of the Bemba tribe. I spoke the local language, Ichi Bemba. I lived amongst a village. I lived amongst a family, rather, and I remember when I arrived at this location, a sacrifice 
was made immediately. My greeting was a sacrifice. One of the greatest greetings I've ever had in my life where a goat was hanging from a tree and I was handed a knife to slaughter a goat and we feasted for the week together as a family. And I was now invited and welcomed. And there's something about this notion of the sacrifice that I've been contemplating and thinking about a lot recently. And well, in the village, what I've recognized is there's a hierarchy, right? There's a hierarchy that exists. And I'm reminded of my time growing up in Roman Catholic school from grades pre-K to eight. It was a great experience. You know, we would wake up in the morning saying the Pledge of Allegiance, right? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. You know, there's this hierarchy and then we would go into prayer. And I, I think that there's something about these things that connect and maybe nationalism. Yeah, ultimately it's a good thing. And so when I consider the hierarchy of God, nation and land or God, tribe and land, God, family and land, you know, where we all really are just one big family. When you think about it, like we all stem from this big family tree, like one small seed planted. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, when you consider this hierarchy in a village, it really does become this prominent paradigm shifting worldview for me because I saw how people can thrive under a thatched roof, the ultimate freedom. Um, while Electricity is good, and I'm very thankful for our founding fathers, such as Benjamin Franklin and his inventions of the lightning rod and these kind of things. Um, <laughs> there's something special about living off the land, off the grid that I learned about. And so in the family, there is this hierarchy, right? Where the mother is coming home with firewood on her head, baby on her back, the father is building churches and homes. The boys are building bricks with sand and mud. The girls are sweeping the floors. The girls are preparing food for the day, right? Everyone has a role to play in the village. Every ant has a role to play in the colony. And at the center of the colony, at the center of the village, there is a gathering place, you know? And at this gathering place at the church at the center of it there's an altar and at this altar a sacrifice is made where we remind ourselves of the sacrifices that Jesus Christ made on the cross that ultimate ideal the man to strive to become and so when you make this sacrifice in the church and you come together as a community as a tribe under God sharing the land you all strive to become the greatest versions of yourselves you all thrive together right there's that ideal man there's that archetype that hero and while i do recognize my christian upbringing perhaps actually to contemplate the teachings of jesus and the philosophy of him you know, where consider Jesus of Nazareth, consider Jesus as man, consider Jesus as teacher, you know, to follow the teachings, I believe ultimately lead to paradise, where it's of your mind, you know, where paradise is not necessarily the things that you do, but the things that you don't do, right? And there's a lot of things that actually are taught through Jesus on what to do, what not to do. One in particular being to turn the other cheek, right? To be meek and be humble. Now, I actually feel as though when I interpret this, it's brought nothing but positive uh, response in my everyday life. What's up, man? You trying to be like me? Yo, dude, do you know what the secret is? Eat red meat and get good sleep. Eight hours a day, 
keeps the doctors yeah, away right there. bro thank you you know what it really is though it really is a scam like the food pyramid they've told us like that whatever yeah. that is, well, this is like this, this shit holding stuff but well, this, this, shit, this, right shit, this shit yeah. like the soda the the the, the, the power aids whatever it's all processed junk that feeds your body with poison yeah and it leads to obesity it leads right, to being though. sick it leads right. to being in the bed that Maybe, that shit too. like i feel like it makes you weak and it just makes you crawl up in bed you don't want to do shit yeah. fasting Bro, I don't eat breakfast or lunch, and I only eat one meal at night, which is extreme. Is but it when a big you, meal, though? It's a fucking massive meal. Like, I feast like a god. Like, I eat like a savage. I have sometimes, like, three pounds of ground beef, and then I'll have a dozen eggs. Like, all the <laughs> shit that the doctors tell you not to do. Yeah. They say that cholesterol is bad for you, this and that. Look, I think everyone's different. We all have different bodies, and, like, we respond to things differently. Yeah. But I found the secret for the past 19 months of just fasting and then gorging before I go to bed, yeah. and then you're full. Yeah. You have no cravings, like that's bread true. and all this yeah, kind of shit. Yeah, problem too, is snacking. And like yeah, 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 like meal little meal squirrels, but like I live my life like I'm a soldier. Like I'm like, let me just pretend like it's ancient Rome and I'm a soldier, you know, defending the castle or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, what, what would they be doing? Snacking on Fuck. bullshit during the day? Like, uh, no, like they would be watching their outposts. They would be protecting the people. And then when they go home, feast. Cause it's a waste of time. Yeah. Um, but like a lot of the snacks and all these processed foods, they just make you addicted. Like breads, carbs, they break down into sugars, which then makes your, insulin spike or something and you just become addicted i don't know man no it right. is a problem like right. the food pyramid's a scam they tell you to not eat as much red meat Be they say to eat it sparingly yeah and then ever since i started eating it maximally and eliminating you everything i feel like i know i don't need food anymore like i'm satiated yeah. like i can go 48 hours without eating yeah like fat is energy that's what i've also realized it's yeah. not about calories like they say oh the burn calories go for a run that's bullshit. Yeah. i don't run i just walk but when you consider calories right like person a eats 2000 calories of cookies person b eats 2000 calories of red meat who's going to be more strong who's going to be more fit obviously meat. so it's about eliminating things it's not necessarily being like me and being crazy carnivore diet but it's, but it's eliminating the, all of the bad the stuff meat. it's all of the fake processed junk if you go to a grocery store all of the bullshits in the center yeah. right it tricks you with all these popping beautiful colors like that Gatorade whatever that looks good I don't know yeah. why but there's something about these bright colors that yeah. looks good that's why I like bright clothes yeah. um, and so they like put those all in the center under fluorescent lights and you're like oh let me grab that let me eat this yeah, yeah, yeah. but all the good shit it's usually on the outskirts yeah. like all the like the real food it's like the meats the right proteins there, the yeah. eggs it's like, like it's yeah. like eating more eggs and eating more meat just makes you full it just makes you it does. feel better um there's something about it like dude a wolf the first thing a wolf eats when it kills its prey is the liver the beef liver is the most nutrient dense food in the world, but no one wants to eat it because it sounds gross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go once a week at the Hal Timmons farm in Reading Terminal. I eat a pound to two pounds of beef liver, but the next day you feel like Genghis Khan ready to take over the freaking world. <laughs> it's crazy the results you feel when you eat beef liver. And it makes sense that the wolf eats that firstly. Yeah. You know, the wolf and liver, that intrigues me. Like I want to be like that wolf, bro. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so yeah. like eating the freaking scraps, may sound crazy but that right. shit gives you so much energy yeah yeah and then, like the energy is stored within your body like the amount of energy you have the amount of fat on your body can sustain you like you would be able to fast easily it would be difficult though like you would be fine to like not eat for a day yeah. and then like gorge the next evening and that would set your body up in this like new way like if you would do that for a week it's gonna be fucking hard man yeah, yeah but if yeah. you do it for a week and you overcome that little bit of pain, bro, it'll be crazy. Like if you're genuinely interested in becoming yeah, no, healthier and stronger, bro, like you should totally go for it. Like a lot of the shit that we consume is poison. Yeah, and sure. I think that just like recognizing the power in natural foods, yeah, like meat. Like I think a lot of the vegetable based yeah. diets are bullshit yeah. though. Like when you eat veggies, it's well, like I you're a little- need protein, man. Protein, think like think of a cow. Like the cow eats the grass. Yeah. I eat the cow. Like there's a hierarchy. Like we are the apex predator, like the wolf in the wild. You know what yeah. I mean? And so, yeah, maybe we need to eat more liver, more meat, more eggs, like more of the stuff that actually fuels our bodies. Like, yeah. 
it's the oldest tale in time like the sacrifice yeah. like making the sacrifice of the animal right like flesh like we need to eat flesh like my new philosophy is flesh is real it is you know and that's that's what we should eat not not the weeds not these little freaking whatever's yeah you're right like a little cow like mm -hmm. <laughs> like the cows fart because they eat the green stuff yeah guess i don't fart dude no never Usually, isn't, isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's when you eat fiber right? and also bad shit. But like fiber, I'm starting to think you don't need. Like fiber is the stuff that makes you poop a lot. Yeah. But when I'm eating meat, you think, oh, how do you go to the bathroom? Whatever. Bro, you shit every morning at the same time, but you don't shit like a maniac. Yeah. You shit like a normal person. Yeah. Like when you eat fibrous foods, like if I were to eat a fibrous meal, I would actually be shitting out all the good stuff that the meat has in it. All the nutrients are in meat. Yeah, you shit yeah. too much and then you're hungrier. Yeah, no, so they have you shit, and, shit more of the good stuff you need and then you go back out there and you're hungry and you buy more shit you don't need. Yeah. Like it's a whole cycle that and I freaking see. broke, bro. It's like... And they try to trick you into buying fiber because they think you, you're like... You need it. You know, constipate or seem like you're not shitting out. You yeah, need yeah. Like, yeah. But when you eat meat, you do shit, bro. Yeah, it's, yeah you do. It just might take it your body a, water. a minute to get used to. As long as you're taking... Drinking normal amounts of water, whatever you're eating, you're gonna shit normal. Bro, have you ever had uh, beef pho? Beef pho. Oh, the... Vietnamese shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had that before? Yeah, yeah. Bro, that is it. Like, that's, that's a one. healing food. I mean, it's water. water. Bro, it's exactly it is... It is bone need. broth <laughs> and beef mm -hmm. and, you know, there's... Uh, I believe it's rice noodles. It's not egg-based. Yeah. But the rice noodles are lighter. But there's something about bone broth, beef, beef pho. It's a restoring healing broth, bro. Yeah. Like, there's something about the word restaurant that I've been thinking about. Like, restaurant, like, you go to a restaurant, you usually buy, like, some shit, whatever, fries, sides. Bro, restaurant originally was used to restore people's health. Like, restaurant, restore. Like, that's where the word derives yeah. from. And um, to me, like, if I think of the etymology of the word restaurant to restore you, the only real restaurant in the city are beef pho places because they're actual healing broths. Yeah. That's good for your gut. There's good... Yeah, healing qualities in it. <laughs> have you, shit. you ever have kim kimchi? Kimchi, no. That's some like Korean dish. It's like fermented cabbages, which has good probiotics that enhances your gut health. And I started eating only red meat and kimchi, and that shit changed my life. Like kimchi, there's something in it too that's like a healing quality because of the probiotics, I think. Yeah. And bro, your gut is more intelligent than your brain. There's so many microbiomes and little aliens in there that are talking yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. I think that the uh, the gut is almost, yeah, I think it is more smart. Like, it's more intelligent, like listening to your gut. Like they say, trust your gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's a reason, <laughs> like there's a fucking reason, bro. Yeah, there is. That's why I don't like having anything in my belly in the day because I have a clear connection to my God-like intuition that comes from the gut. That's what I think. That's deep, man. Yeah, bro, it's like God or something. <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm just gonna keep walking now. Yeah. No, I, I hope I didn't like run your ear off. Yeah, you're chilling, bro. Yeah. Chilling I like talking with people and cool, talking bro. about shit. Like you mentioned something about health, so nah, I'm like, that's good, I've, I've been thinking about it during my about, walk. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. I've been thinking about it during my walk. It's like, I think that, you know, small ideas and like sharing them can go a long way. It definitely can. You know, like even my uncle struggled with like diabetes and stuff and I've been having him go on the beef pho. Yeah. I can totally see a difference in his physiology and his results. Like he's seeming like more healthy since yeah. embracing more meats in his diet. Excuse me? Um, are you looking for like the boat ride? I think it's actually by the Spruce Street Harbor. So you're gonna wrap around and then go down the Columbus Boulevard towards the, the Spruce Street Harbor. I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's where all the docks are, all the boats are. Okay. It's down that way, it's just right beyond the bridge. Okay. I hope that you find it. I think that's where it is though. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Go catch my ride. Yeah, I'll catch your ride, bro. Take that into- Yeah, meat and eggs, bro. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, dude. Pleasure yeah. talking with you, man. Good talking Yeah, you. enjoy. Kimchi, you said, right? Um, yeah, kimchi and beef. Yeah, kimchi, Korean dish. You can get in the writing terminal. Okay. Everything you can find in there, man. Right. Trust the Amish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Amish, I trust. See, when I start talking, I don't know why, but I oftentimes just want to like share the good news, give advice. Maybe it's just because it's what I'm trying to do now with my camera, but there's something in me that just wants to spread 
the word, right? Like this guy was obviously, you know, looking at me in admiration, right? This guy was sitting on the bench, sort of like, I want to get like you. It's like, dude, you can too. Like we can all, like, that's the thing. It's like, we can all thrive together. Like we can all strive to become the greatest version of ourselves. And, you know, I'm just like sharing things that I've learned along the way, right? Think of liver, seriously, and the way that the wolf hunts its prey. The first thing that it eats is the liver, right? Think of the wolf and the way that it raised Remus and Romulus in the wild. Um, think of the story of Prometheus being tied down to the rock, you know, where the eagle or the vulture constantly ate on his liver, right? There's obviously some significance to the liver and power and Prometheus and the myth being him stealing fire from the gods, you know, the ancient Greek gods, and then giving this fire to the people and allowing the people to create civilization, technology, and advancements were made through Prometheus's actions of defiance against the gods. And he was, in ancient Greek mythology, the person responsible for creating humans through clay. And part of me wants to return to the Garden of Eden that was, or that, that Adam and Eve were banished from and then locked away from with the flaming swords, pick up those swords and burn the garden down and create something new. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> is man, is man, um, is man permitted to strive to become a demigod? Is man permitted to strive for something greater than themselves, something transcendent. Um, I don't know, maybe societal norms kind of have us limited where maybe our imagination is clouded. I don't know that we have this imaginative spirit anymore in life. And I think actually a part of it is because of our lack of a connection to the cosmos, the stars up above in cities, where when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I remember looking up at the stars. I remember viewing these incredible constellations, shooting stars. I could see the satellites moving. Um, yeah, I remember every night, you know, spending time speaking with my host father. You know, one of the most interesting things, I remember we were underneath the thatched roofs that we formed with sticks and tarps that was during a two-week Seventh-day Adventist church camp where I witnessed baptisms and you know I got to photograph funerals and all these kind of things in this um, kind of couple weeks span um, but we were going to bed after looking up at the stars and he was describing to me the spirit of Jezebel and giving me like some story about Jezebel and Maybe I should learn about that more because that was one of the stories I remember him trying to like like he was like really trying to like leave me with like this story like or guide me in this story before going to bed. What is the story of Jezebel? You know, he was like really describing to me this and like, you know, because he, he could speak a little bit of English and then I would speak Bemba and it was kind of hard like to communicate. Marriage of Ahab. Conflict with Elijah. Jezebel's actions led to a significant conflict with the prophet Elijah who defended the worship of Yahweh. <laughs> Jezebel sought revenge for the slaughter of Baal's prophets by ordering a persecution and killing of Yahweh's prophets. No, the content may violate our terms of use, so just ask a simple question. Um, she is remembered as a symbol of wickedness and the dangers of allowing foreign influences to corrupt the faith and practices of Israel. So yeah, there was something about that story I remember him talking to me about in the middle of the night. And it's like we, you know, we look up at the stars, we think of stories, we'd share stories under the stars. Um, you know, 
Maybe we lack that in like modern society. Hey, look at the turtles. Turtles. Look at those turtles. Hehe. <laughs> We photograph them. Photograph the turtles. I like turtles. I like turtles. Yeah, maybe there's something about memes. You know, there's that meme, I like turtles. So like some kid in a carnival or, carnival, carnival or something, he's like, I like turtles. It's like uh, memes are like the smallest unit of information. Like memes are like genes, right? And they sort of uh, describe who and what we are. And so when I consider language and stories and the way that we share them, yeah, maybe it's similar to that of memes in modern culture. Yeah, memes are information. Um, and so I think before I started to talk with that guy over there, I was describing these notion, this notion of following the, um, like the, uh, the teachings of Jesus, right? Like just considering Jesus as man, Jesus as philosopher, which is really interesting to me. And, you know, turning the other cheek, when I was in Jericho, I will never forget, um, you know, photographing at this scene, being surrounded by people that I was mostly familiar with, but then one boy in particular, this young man was, trying to stunt on me, flex on me. He came up to me. He pulled my camera off my neck. He broke my camera strap and I just simply didn't respond, sort of just stoically looked him in the eyes and he was baffled and huffing and puffing, but I, I held my ground. And I think that this is really wise because when you're in an unfamiliar situation, you need to find ways to avoid conflict or diffuse conflict and by not reacting i believe i did the right thing you know by turning the other cheek i was able to come out unscathed during this trying time in jericho and i'll never forget going to my friend muhammad's house the next day who i would spend each and every day with gardening his friend hassan's garden um he mended my camera strap with tape or string or something and then you know i went out and kept making pictures and you know i think that you know there's something about this notion of turning the other cheek that maybe you know seems more submissive or lacking in power and strength but actually you can fuel yourself with that powerful feeling by actually not responding and not reacting whether or not you think it would be a good time for you to retaliate. You know, but then there's the idea of Jesus and his aggression that was justified overthrowing the, or over overturning the, te uh, the tables at the money lenders outside of the temple and using his whip. Um, so there is like a time for justified aggression, but also peace and stoicism. And so, during my recent trip to Rome, I had this incredible experience where I intuitively decided to quit my job as a photographer for the city. I didn't think it was fulfilling at all. I decided to pack up my bags and go to Rome. Um, I started to go to church after a really long hiatus and I no longer go to the church. I sort of just pray at home or just meditate at home or alone. and. Yeah, I don't really think you have to go to any particular church and belong to them. But, so, I started going and I realized they started saying this prayer to St. Michael the Archangel and it really amazed me because it felt like I was going into battle when we ended Mass. And this wasn't something I ever learned as a young boy. I never uh, recited or learned the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel, who I later learned is the leader of God's army. And so I returned to Rome. There's something in me that just needed to go there. I've been going there since I'm a little boy. I'm now a dual citizen between Italy and America. And I would connect with family there. And so I went to Rome and every single day I would go to the castle outside of the Vatican and pray to St. Michael the Archangel trying to learn this prayer as he's seated on top of this sculpture of, of, of the castle, you know, gracefully holding his sword, thrusting the devil into the ground. And I went for a day trip to Paris and 
I remember on this day trip, you know, I had 24 hours, 48 hours basically. You know, one of the days I actually met like a friend of Brisson, which was crazy outside of the Eiffel Tower. Um, you know, she was describing to me how they were friends because I made this photo for her and her family and she was like, oh, the composition is like Brisson. I was like, oh, you knew him? Like he, t she talked about it. Uh, but I'm getting off track here. After I went to photograph this Eiffel Tower on that day, I went to bed that night and I had this vivid dream. I've been having vivid dreams since 2023, actually. The first one, I remember I was laying on the ground and it was from first person perspective in a very snowy place, presumably Antarctica. I looked up at the sun, which looked like an eclipse. There was this sphere, this circle in the sky, the sort of eclipse depicted in my dream. I turned down and look at a man that's lying on the ground underneath the tree. And then as I pan back to the center, there's a group of mammoths that charge towards me and I wake up. Uh. And so that was my first vivid dream. And that happened here in Philadelphia. But when I returned to Rome and I, and I went to Paris for this day trip, after learning the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, I went to sleep and I had this dream. And this dream was very vivid and I can still picture both of these dreams. And in this dream, a double rainbow appeared in the sky that transformed into a clouded dragon, chased me through a city, poofed, disappeared, and I woke up abruptly, similar to the last dream. And the next day I walk through Paris, I discover a sculpture of St. Michael the Archangel surrounded by these two dragon statues. I look up at the sculpture and there's a freaking rainbow. I have no idea what any of this stuff means because I'm just starting to dream, I'm just starting to pray, I'm just starting to learn about this stuff again since the long hiatus, since I was like 13 and I'm 28 years old now. And I called my godmother who was a nun for 40 years and she was like, this is a wink from God. And honestly, I think that this story and this experience has like shaped me and I feel like I've reached the pinnacle of this sort of journey of finding meaning and finding God. And I really do believe that I had this wink, um, this sort of miracle in a way that I saw in real life the following day after a dream. And it really does astonish me because I have no idea what these dragons symbolize. I really didn't know much about St. Michael. I was just trying to learn because it was something new in the church and all of it came through intuition. And I think that we should follow it. I think that we should trust our intuition and yeah, move forward from the gut and shoot from the heart. Yeah. So I don't know, that's my story. You know, that's really, it. I mean, I've, I wanted to say this and like vocalize this, but I don't know how to. I recorded my response and stuff in the moment of these dreams just because, but I really do think it's incredible and profound when you experience these things in real life. Then I've definitely been in a period of like solitude, just sort of thriving on my own, which maybe is another reason why I've been having these incredible experiences, sort of disconnecting and connecting with the divine. With something more, with something greater, you know, when I was in Rome and I traveled to Florence and I was looking up at the sculpture of Achilles in the hands of Ajax being carried away from battle during his death. You know, it was a beautiful death. You know, where Achilles and these heroes, whether Hercules, David, Achilles, Jesus, right? These are men and people and stories that shape us that we can strive to become. And <laughs> needless to say, I'm inspired when I'm in Rome. I'm inspired when I'm surrounded by beauty. And I think that is where I thrive, so. Yeah, when I look up at that sculpture, it reminds me that I too can strive to be that hero and gracefully die, where I no longer fear of death. You know, for I wake up in the morning and I'm simply grateful to have another breath.
and treat each morning like this mini birth and each night like a mini death um, then you're just grateful for the next day and with fearlessness and courageousness yeah the the end of the video game of you know whether or not you beat the boss or get defeated by the boss and die you know the outcome it's irrelevant for you fear not of it this is a great skate spot wow look at this skate spot this is a real nice one they got like coping here nice little bank you know when i was a little boy i remember we would go to frank fdr skate park and throw ourselves down the ramps me and my brother learned to skate at like four or five years old you know i attribute that to a lot of my courageousness we would I remember the first time i went to the fdr this guy smashed his freaking skull the ice cream truck came and relieved his pain with like ice cream on his forehead he was gushing in blood and um holy that was a crazy thing to see when i was four or five this guy just slamming himself down this freaking ramp but i kept going back out there and throwing myself down the ramps yeah maybe we got to be more like that skater that intrepid courageous free spirit and here we are at penn treaty fairmont park check it out i made it I remember when I was a young boy, we would explore the abandoned building over there that I don't think is abandoned anymore. You know, I remember climbing and exploring in that building, whatever whatever the building is over there, me and my brother, he would, he would climb at the top of those, because he liked the graffiti and stuff. He would climb at the top of that freaking ladder. Yeah, they definitely renovated it, but we used to climb. That was like one of the first times I remember exploring when I was in high school, we would go out here and climb. But, you know, even I think of childhood, I remember we would spend a lot of the time in the woods, you know, thinking of this park and the Lenape tribe and the Native Americans that dwelled in the lands around here. I remember when I grew up exploring the Wissahickon Forest and building teepees with sticks and bridges with stones. I remember discovering caves and totem poles and sharpening spears and attempting to hunt deer. Um, there's always been this inner adventure and call to adventure within me since a very young age, climbing trees, exploring the forests, caving, carving my own paths, building my own forts, sort of subconsciously after learning about the Native Americans in middle school and yeah I feel like that sort of spirit of play like I was a child exploring in the woods is something that I now want to relive sort of just like that child in the woods tinkering and exploring you know I want to live that way every day sort of just embracing that spirit of play, right? Where these scribbles, these chalk marks, presumably made by children, are some of the most pure art. And yeah, maybe we must return to be a child again. Pigeons on top of William Penn. I think there's like a mask going on. The Great Treaty. Para que confirme que Jehová la palabra que me habló diciendo, si tus hijos guardan mi camino, andando delante de mí, en verdad, 
I'm gonna get close. This is so cool. Pero le dice también, esfuérzate. Que lo que nos lleva a decir que la tarea que desarrollamos como padres no es fácil. ¿Va a necesitar de qué? Esfuerzo. Hoy en día hay muchas cosas que usted puede complementarse. Porque usted necesita no solamente esforzarse, usted dirá, ah, en el momento de trabajo, por Esfuérzate en el sentido de crece, madura, aprende, eh, llénate de más conocimiento. Y nosotros podemos esforzarnos en tantas maneras, pero él está diciendo a Salomón, esfuérzate y sé hombre. ¿Cómo así? ¿Y por qué está haciendo esa aclaración? Porque Salomón era un joven. Y la tarea que tenía por delante no era fácil. Era recibir un reinado con muchas complicaciones. Y para eso él necesitaba ser esforzado. Él necesitaba conocer su posición. Salomón eh, necesitaba la, la, la habilidad para desarrollar ese rol tan grande que él esperaba. Wow, the building really no isn't abandoned de... anymore? El, el Señor cuando nos les entregó el rol de padres a ustedes. It's actually used for housing. Oh my God, that place was a dump. That place was abandoned up the wazoo. Esto no está diciendo que sea machista. Esto no está diciendo que grite mucho para que vea que usted es el que manda. No. Esto le está diciendo tome su posición. On this site, in 1682, William Penn signed a treaty with the Delaware tribe of Native Americans under the canopy of the Great American Elm Tree. The tree was destroyed during a storm on March 3, 1810. This direct descendant of the original tree was planted on 1993, Arbor Day, April 29th. Wow. So this is where the tree was. This is where the treaty was made. This is cool. Glad I came here today. So this is where it was. I gotta get a hammock. What a beautiful park, actually. I haven't been here in many, many years. I believe there's some rocks or something you can go and sit on over there, or there's an area by the water, maybe. My GoPro's on one bar. Let's check out the park. Wow. Beautiful day. Yeah, this is a great view. No biking. On this path, it says, oh, American flag. Looks like there's a little garden back here. Is that person fishing? No, cleaning up the garden, probably. Yeah, here's that spot I was thinking of, right? There's like rocks and logs. Yo, this is so cool. Boats.
Stinks over here. Little parkour area. Benches. Dude's just chilling. Oh, there's a tree stump. I want to conquer this tree stump. That was fun. It's a relatively small park. Maybe there's even more spots. Yeah, she's chilling right there on the rocks. I knew that there were spots like this.